All right. Good morning. Happy Friday. Let's get started. Today we're going to continue to explore culture and we'll be doing an activity that starts to uh, pick at that just a little bit more. Um, so in addition to having a practice multiple choice question for today, uh, if you were not here on Wednesday or you did not have the chance to do this on Wednesday, I'm asking folks to complete an anonymous survey uh, that's just letting me know how things are going for the course. So if you have a device with you and you were not here on Wednesday, uh, I encourage you to take a few minutes right here on the front page of Canvas to complete that form. Uh, for those of you who have already completed that form, thank you for doing that. I'm starting to look through comments and I'll be talking about them and discussing some of the adjustments made based on the feedback received so far. So thank you for doing that. So I'll give you a few minutes for those of you who are not here on Wednesday to do that. Uh, and for everybody else to take some time to look at uh, this practice question. So this connects back to measures of cultural intelligence that we talked about on Wednesday. So Taylor's traveling to Croatia. She wants to learn the language. Uh, and adapt to that culture's norms and be sensitive to the differences in communication. Uh, which of these four could best describe her cultural intelligence, right? So the key thing to focus on here is her uh, wanting to learn the language. So take a couple minutes to think about this and we'll talk about it together. Anybody who'd like some more time on this one? All right. So Taylor wants to learn this uh, new culture and adapt to this culture's norms and rules. How many people think that the best answer here is A, cognitive, B, motivational, C, metacognitive, or D, behavioral? Yes. So the best answer here is D, uh, motivational, right? The desire or want to change your behavior is really the key word here. Uh, motivational, right? Uh, is about what we would like to do. So if you're motivated to study for an exam, you're going to put in the work to prepare for that. Um, my parents were both therapists. They like to tell a joke. How many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, one, but they have to want to change, right? This <coughs> idea of motivation playing into uh, our communication. <laughs> so motivational is here. Metacognitive is being aware of your own thinking, right? Um, essentially, uh, Figuring out what you know and don't and recognizing, wow, I don't know if I should be giving eye contact in this culture or what the norms are with dining in this culture. Maybe I need to work on that. 
cognitive refers to the knowledge that you have, again, the cogs in the machine, and behavioral is referring to the actions that you are taking uh, within a culture, right? So knowing and being able to distinguish these four different types of cultural intelligence as we did in the activity on Wednesday, I think is a great thing just to refresh on as you're gearing up for the exam. All right, any questions about anything that we talked about last class or anything else, especially uh, knowing that we have the midterm coming up next week? Questions do come up at any point and you'd like to stop me, feel free to let me know. So we talked about ethnocentrism, right? Some of the challenges of stereotypes and bias in the way that we think about cultures. We talked about some of these spectrums of defined cultures. I'm gonna be recapping that a little bit more because I know that I went through that a little quickly. Uh, and also we spent some time talking about those cultural intelligence measurements. For today, uh, I just want to go over the timeline related to the midterm exam. Uh, elements of culture and communication, and a little activity that'll help us to examine and make sense of ways the cultures communicate. So um, to give you, again, a sense of the schedule and um, what you need to know as you're gearing up, right? Next Monday's class meeting, we'll be reviewing and going over the midterm. Um, so I encourage you to come to Monday's class with any questions that you have um, especially, I encourage you to look through the study guide that's on the front page of Canvas to see if there are any terms, concepts, or ideas that you're a little less familiar with, uh, or practice questions among those that are provided uh, in that set uh, on Canvas that you'd like us to go over in more detail. Uh, so the sky's the limit in terms of the things that you bring in to help you to study and review for the exam. I'll be bringing in a few things to help you, but uh, I do encourage you to Use that time to ask questions. Um, attendance will be optional at Monday's class meeting, but definitely come to class if you're interested in doing some additional things to prepare. But if you're feeling good uh, and ready to go, no need to attend. Uh, so the midterm, again, will open on Wednesday, uh, October 26th on Canvas. Uh, and then it will close um, on Friday the 28th at midnight, right? So you have the three days between the Wednesday and Friday for 72 hours in which you can take the exam. Um, we do not have class meetings next Wednesday or Friday so that you can use that time uh, to potentially take the exam. Uh, and then um, once you choose to take the exam, you've got the two hours to complete it. The only other thing that I would remind you about is uh, the fourth Canvas prompt. Uh, is due by the end of the day today. So if the fourth Canvas prompt about culture is one of the ones that you want to do, uh, make sure to get that in today. A few notes, and again, some things to help you, since I know that for some of you, this might be our last class meeting until after the exam. Uh, it's open note and open book, but I do recommend that you come in working through the study guide and adding your own notes or having a set of notes for yourself that you could easily refer to that connect some of these concepts and ideas, right? A lot of times people are able to work through the exam questions well, uh, but, right, reading through the text uh, for the first time will take too long in order to complete the exam, right? So I encourage you to have some of that reading and some of those notes done ahead of time so that you can come into the exam with a set of notes that will help to make that easier and faster. Uh, there will probably be, be a couple questions in which you are referring back to your uh, notes or even referring back to a reading, but giving yourself more time by having a set of notes to use, I think will help a lot. Got those two hours, so it's 25 multiple choice and three short essay options you can pick out of four. So I encourage you to split your time between those. Uh, Multiple choice looks very similar to what we did. The short essay looks like the one that you did last week uh, and the ones on Canvas. Um, and uh, if you still want feedback or want to send your short essay questions to me to let me know what grade you've received, you're welcome to do that. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to let you know about is uh, I'm happy to answer questions or support you either through office hours when I'm upstairs or through Zoom through an appointment or through helping answer questions about email. For instance, you might say, I was gone on the day where we talked about cultural intelligence. What is that? Can you talk with me about that? I'm happy to answer those questions and help you as you gear up for the exam. But once the midterm opens, 
next Wednesday, right, through next Friday. Uh, it will be kind of a blackout on communication related to content. So I can answer questions and answer emails related to other things. But once the midterm window starts, I will not be able to answer any questions for you about content in the course that might be on the internet. So again, I encourage you to get in touch with me before Wednesday if there are things that you'd like some additional help with, classes that you missed, that you'd like to go over in more detail, and so on. So uh, just some notes there as you're preparing uh, and all of that. And I'll also use some Canvas announcements to update you on that. The link to take the exam will just be on Canvas. It's not proctored, right? You don't need to take it from a specific location or use specific software outside of just a tab open uh, in order to access that. Any other questions? Okay, great. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, talking a bit more about face negotiation theory and some of the ideas of face negotiation theory because this is something that is talked about uh, in your Canvas prompt for today, and I think it's just something that we can explore in a little bit more detail. So I wanted to share a short clip which uh, Dr. Celestine Toomey, who developed face negotiation theory, is talking about this idea and explaining some of the ways that it shapes uh, how our cultures communicate. So um, in addition to helping to lay out this idea of face being something that we communicate, uh, one thing that I think Ting Tumi brings up that's uh, an important idea is that in more individualistic cultures, there is greater concern for maintaining your own face. Uh, so for instance, um, making sure that your reputation or profile or uh, the way that you come across to other people is more important. For example, uh, updating you on social media, uh, having a current photo on LinkedIn or through other methods of social media might be seen as more important. Whereas in more collectivist cultures, there is greater emphasis on this idea of other face. That is, we are more concerned in collectivist cultures about uh, the reputation and well being of other people in the group. You might be familiar with this idea of like secondhand anxiety uh, or secondhand awkwardness, right? Where you see a friend or a person put into an awkward or uncomfortable situation and you're feeling empathy or feeling bad for that person. Uh, for instance, if your friend is getting up to give a presentation and they're having a bit of trouble, right? Uh, more collectivist cultures have greater concern for the well being and reputation of others in the group and might take measures to support the reputation of other people. Uh, for instance, saying, oh, well, you're fine, you did a great job, we're really happy for you, you did a great presentation, right, to help that person feel comfortable in those contexts. So 
According to face negotiation theory, regardless of culture, right, people try to maintain face. The importance of reputation or how you come across to other people might look a little bit different depending on the values and norms of that culture. For instance, how that culture views body image, how that culture views personal success versus collective well-being. But regardless of culture, there's this notion that there is reputation among members of a group that is important for participation. But uh, face, right, and the idea of managing face or the persona that you present to other people is especially challenging in emotionally charged situations. For instance, if you and a close friend get into a fight uh, and you say some insults to each other, right, maintaining and managing your relationship, apologizing, saying that you were out of line, would be a way that you would try to negotiate face and reputation in that situation. We talked last class about some of the spectrums to define culture, one of them being individual and collectivism. Um, again, individualistic cultures like the United States are more focused on individual achievement. Collectivist cultures like Japan or China are more focused on the well-being of the group. But there's also this idea that we brought up a power distance, right? So power distance, uh, when there's higher power distance, it generally means that you are not communicating uh, as directly to superiors. So in higher power distance, uh, you and a boss uh, do not have a democratic and open way to disagree. So uh, if you think your boss is terrible and giving you the worst hours, you don't tell them that, generally speaking. But in lower power distance, there's more open communication for people who have different levels of authority or power. For instance, uh, you know, telling grandma that she's racist, that might be an example of uh, lower power distance because the age and authority that she has might be less important compared to a more democratic dialogue. Individualism and collectivism also means, as mentioned, uh, as Ching Tumi brought up, that in more individualistic cultures, we're concerned about managing our own reputation versus collectivist cultures that generally take measures to protect the reputation and well being of the group. Uh, the strategies that we can use to manage face work could look different across power distance. In other words, right, um, we are more likely to apologize profusely to say, you know, we messed up and we're going to try to do better in higher power distance. And we might more openly disagree with a superior uh, in lower power distance. Um, the differences and variability for cultures impact how they manage and negotiate face, as we've talked about. Um, and then there's this idea of intercultural facework competence, uh, or the idea that we are dealing with and considering the needs of other cultures when we're negotiating and managing our face and reputation, right? For instance, um, if you find yourself in a situation where you ate first at the dinner table in a culture that that is not seen as respectful to do, um, competence in this situation might be to say nothing and to issue a written apology later, right? Or to, uh, in the context of a political or social leader, issue a statement apologizing for behavior that was uh, disrespectful to members of a different culture. So um, developing these face work competence skills means <clears throat> thinking about context, thinking about elements of uh, cultural intelligence that we talked about last class and integrating those into your relationships with other people. Again, we spent some time talking about uh, face negotiation theory, but I wanted to hit on some of these ideas in a little bit more detail uh, so that we can fully grasp what it's getting at. We went over these spectrums to define cultures uh, last class as well. And I just wanted to see if there's anybody who um, has any questions about these or would like to see any of these elaborated on further. Again, uh, this came, came from Stuart Hall, who was a developer of cultural studies and the idea that we can define uh, and contrast different cultures and the approaches and communication strategies that they use. So these measures of a spectrum help us to think about these differences. I'm asking you to pick one of those spectrums for your fault this week. Could you actually give an example on the low versus high context? Oh, yes, under low versus high context culture. Yeah. Uh, so low context cultures, right, are ones in which um, there is a focus on language and verbal communication 
and a greater focus on saying what you mean and being very direct, right? So um, if you and somebody else uh, and a roommate, right, are deciding about chores, uh, you might tell your roommate, no, I don't want to do the chores, right? So that greater emphasis on directness means that there is lower context. You're saying what you mean. In a higher context, greater emphasis is placed on nonverbal communication, your use of gestures, tone of voice, facial expressions. So that might mean in higher context cultures, you're saying maybe, or you're a little bit hesitant, or you're looking off to the side, or you're saying yes, but you're doing so in a uh, kind of um, held back way, right? You don't seem like you really want to. Uh, but you're saying yes anyway. In that case, the context comes from your tone of voice, your nonverbal behavior, um, and that matters more to understand the message. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great, good question. All right. So what I want to do now uh, is uh, give you some time to work through a uh, reading uh, called Body Ritual of the Nasarima. So um, I have linked this on Canvas, but I've also printed out several copies for people to read uh, in person. Uh, so if you check on the front page of Canvas, the Nasarima article is linked right here. Um, and I will also hand out some copies. I'd like you to take some time to read through this. And as you're reading, I'd like you to take some notes uh, or potentially highlight some of the ways that this culture communicates. So what is this culture doing? Uh, how might we measure or approach this culture's communication? How many folks would like a paper copy? Okay. So keep your hand raised until I get it to you. Thank you. Other folks, the copies are available for you to check out online. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Okay. Where it can be. Oh. Right here. Yeah.
once you've finished looking through this reading, what I'd like you to do is to find a partnership or group of three, um, have one person who will write or type for attendance, and take some time to answer these questions. How does this culture communicate, considering some of these aspects of culture? How might these spectrums that we've talked about, like power, distance, um, and uh, context, be used to define this culture? And how does this culture negotiate pace? So take some time to chat about this, uh, write down some of your responses, and then we'll talk about that together.
you're not really affected by people Take about three more minutes to continue talking through this. Take another minute.
Okay, so thanks for taking some time in groups to talk a little bit about this. So I'd like us to chat together, uh, having done the reading and also having had the chance to talk to a partner um, to just discuss these questions together. So how does this culture communicate? You can consider some of the things like norms, rules, et cetera, Z. It seems a highly valued these kids. So almost every one of their transactions is like interacting with them. They seem to involve exchanging of these gifts or medicine, harm, uh, concern, stuff of that sort. Um, I would assume from that that they would like this highly valued how much income a person would be able to buy those gifts. Mm -hmm. Right, so oftentimes in culture, we use things such as artifacts, right, and physical goods and items to uh, communicate with one another, giving and exchanging of goods, and the value that different cultures associate uh, with some of those uh, gifts as well. What were other things that groups noticed here about elements of culture? How about here, this group in the front? So we saw a lot of restraint. The rituals were uh, unnecessary with the replacement for the pleasure, but it was involved in the end. Uh, sorry, what was the last part you said? Uh, but for the involvement of the uh -huh. Right. So there is a significant emphasis on restraint uh, in the restraint indulgence spectrum, oftentimes. Uh, cultures that practice restraint are doing so on the basis of presenting themselves to uh, the groups. So things like physical appearance, body modification, right? Those are things that have that group emphasis in mind. Are there any other elements of culture that we can add here or things that are missing? Uh, we said that they believe that the human body is perception. Mm -hmm. And the uh, only way to get it is to that. Right, so a belief in the human body being disgusting or gross, the measures that uh, can be taken, such as the mouth man, right, the uh, doctor that's mentioned toward the end that can provide services to remove the kind of evil from people um, might be uh, ways that we can deal with that. So let's talk a little bit about spectrums here. So um, we had here this discussion about indulgence versus restraint, right? Um, what other spectrums are here? How many people focused on context? How about power distance? There seems to be a lot of power distance in their interactions. Yeah. The ability to use the uh, central temple for healing unless you pay the uh, gift. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, those elements are very much shaping uh, the use of power distance. So there's a couple other elements here in terms of contrasting and uh, helping us to define cultures, right? So um, how many people focused on masculinity or femininity? Yeah. Um, so what were some things that you noticed here about this contrast? Um, there was a difference between when the, the man would come in naked versus the woman uh -huh. and the female coming in naked or the females were seen more as like kind of gross or it was like a, a negative, um, stereotypes for females or just females, it was more normal for them mm -hmm. to. Um, sure, sure. So, differences in how uh, members of these groups kind of perceive gender and make judgments on the body on the basis of gender. And let's talk lastly about negotiating space. Uh, so, uh, what are some of the ways that this culture is negotiating? How about this group over here? Sure. So this culture is trying to manage its reputation, right? Um, and uh, ensure that its members are um, seen well by each other. What were some of the things you noticed that this culture was doing? Oh, 
Uh -huh. So again, connecting to the use of power distance there. Anything else about negotiating face? Yeah, Josh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. There was also the mention to um, the substance, right? So if you can't afford the fancier substance for your homes or for some of the, you know, shelving that sometimes you'd use a makeshift version, right? All right. So how many of you have a pretty good idea of what this culture is? Okay. If you do not know, take a look at Nasarima and uh, read the letters backwards. Mm -hmm. So, right, Nasarina is backwards for American. Uh, as you were reading, right, you might start to notice these. And if you picked up on it already, right, you might have noticed some of these similarities. If you didn't notice, right, don't feel bad. It's designed to intentionally be unclear and to reframe it, right? So uh, the holy mouth men, well, they're dentists. Um, the use of the charm, charm box, uh, charm shrine space, that would be a bathroom. We could think about the usage of shelving or jewelry boxes as part of that. Uh, we have the practitioner who's a listener who's uh, removing evil spirits. That is a therapist, right? The major temples or shrines uh, in which the mouth men and uh, other uh, medicine men participate. Well, those would be hospitals. Uh, so these are ways that we can reframe and think about uh, American culture, right? Um, if we're thinking broadly about that, we see those similarities there. So this article was written several decades ago by Horace Meyer. Uh, so he was an anthropologist uh, and social theorist. And oftentimes in the past, right, when we would study another culture, uh, there was a trend where we had a lot of kind of white, white scholars or researchers who would go in and study another culture or group and would write about them this way, oftentimes portraying them as savage, as strange, as weird, uh, as odd, as off. Right. And Minor wanted to flip that around. So what he did was he took the same language that members of American culture would use to describe other cultures and flipped it back and said, what if we describe and think about American culture in this way? And how does that change the way that we perceive and address that? Right. So it's a practice and kind of acknowledging ethnocentrism and how we think about other cultures and imagining, you know, what are some of the ways that other cultures might think about us? things that we see as taken for granted or default, right? Like going to a dentist, like using a restroom, right? Those are things that in the right light uh, and the right use of language could be framed as incredibly odd, as strange, as outside of cultural norms. So this reading is a chance for us to think about how we use communication to define cultures and ways that we can rethink and break out of ethnocentrism by thinking about different cultures in different ways. So um, I think this is a useful way for us to continue to think about how we engage with cultures, write about, talk about, and understand the needs of different cultural groups. So we talked a little bit about this, the usage of language, usage of face work, and the ways in which cultural practices that might seem off to us due to things like ethnocentrism are things that we can continue to work on challenging. Again, the Nasserima piece is a way for us to think about the role of language and communication and how we define and think about other cultures. So have a great weekend. Uh, again, if you'd like to come on Monday, you're welcome to bring your midterm questions. Please pass forward or email your partner work for today. Your name's on it. Have a great weekend and I will see you next week. Hopefully you're not too mad that I tricked you. Thanks. I will also grab extra copies of these if you have uh, copies you want to hand forward.
Yeah, you don't want it. You. Awesome. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you too.